Thank you, Christina. Um, so, as, as kind of previously alluded to and, and, and demonstrated as, as far as what Christina was showing, um, in some cases, whether it's the rollover or the um, create from catalog process that you use to actually create your course, um, in, in many instances, essentially what you're creating is kind of a course shell, uh, and, and there's a lot of data or attributes that um, are not either going to be there or you're going to need to be able to make adjustments to. Um, so there, there is this you know, understanding that, that um, some course management is going to have to take place. So you um, will be able to, then to uh, go in and so if it's a, a variable credit course, you may want to or need to uh, set or adjust the, the credit limits. Um, uh, of course, you're going to need to be able to go in and schedule uh, days and times and potential locations uh, for going to meet, uh, the need to add and remove instructors from the courses. Uh, and again, institutionally, um, it's going to vary um, whether or not something like prerequisites are adjustable. Uh, for some of us, um, the canonical uh, prerequisite is, is really the driver and can't be changed, uh, but some institutions actually allow them to uh, tweak those prerequisites at the course offering level. And then um, eligibility requirements, and these are, are course uh, eligibility requirements. So these are the things like uh, freshmen only or only students in this major can register for this course. Um, so again, the ability to go in and um, set up your courses to uh, essentially be what you want them to be. Um, in, in quality student, we're also um, supporting these other kind of concepts. Um, I'm not going to talk about them in any great detail, uh, but just to let you know that um, um, these are definitely all uh, a part of it and on the radar as well. And, and so that's dealing with the way we group courses, uh, whether they're cross-listed or joint courses, or maybe courses that are co-located in a single uh, location. Um, sequential courses that uh, run or span the terms. And then, of course, uh, the concept of final exam is also part of the course offering itself. Uh, when the exams are, are going to be offered. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over again to Christina, and she will uh, give you a sense of where we are on some of the wireframes and, and uh, our thinking about uh, managing course offerings. Okay, so this is the same screen you saw before. So this is looking at just the department and the ability to add a, add a section that was not in the previous term. So it wasn't part of the rollover, but well, that was um, if they want to add in some courses that are from their from their catalog, they can add in additional sections that wouldn't have been part of the last rollover. So they can add this 437, writing the situation comedy plot. And because it wasn't part of rollover, it's not going to have any time information or days information. It's just taking this information directly from the canonical unit. And so all that information would need to be added. So from And there's other information that needs to be added to even the ones that were rolled over, like the instructor and the location. So then the, the person who's adding this information comes into a screen where they can put in all of that detail. And this, um, this is not, if you go to look at this on your screen, this is not going to be a complete, uh, not all of the information that's, that's needed for this or um, how, it, how it's um, entered. We're still working on that. But um, you can see that you can add in here the instructor, when, when the meeting times are, if it's a standard um, kind of meeting schedule, the start times and end times, a building request, what building and room you want it to be in, whether it would be the same for all days or different for different days. So if you needed to do some kind of a very structured thing that had a different start time on Tuesday than it did on Thursday, being able to detail that information. 
then go into information about um, the enrollment and whether or not there would be a wait list or a final exam, um, and then whether or not the information would be published. So all of this information is stuff that they would have to add into whatever um, course offering shell that had existed on the last page. So once all that information was put in, then they'd come back to that screen and see that, okay, we've added that this is Tuesday and Wednesday, we've got instructors, we've got a location and a time. One course offering um, writing situation comedy plot might be complete, and these others would need to be filled in in order for this to be this these course offerings to be complete. So that's about it for here. Is there anything anyone would like to to look at closer here or see again before I turn it back over to Bob? I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's not really about this screen, but on the previous, well, just in general, for the canonical learning unit, if one is instantiated an offering and then you need to go back and change something, the problem with our current system is that you have to undo all the stuff that you've instantiated, change the canonical, and then reinstantiate it so it inherits the changes. I'm wondering if uh, it's envisaged that changes can be trickled down to things that have already been created from the canonical. Does that make sense? So are you are you talking about like, like the name of the course or which pieces of information that you need? So I, I think um, I, I understand the question. I mean, really, what you're getting at is the validation against the canonical. And and um, for instance, if so, here's a use case, and tell me if this rings true. Um, say the department code has changed, and you roll over from one year to the next, and you don't want to have to go in and like change each one of those, you would like those changes to, to just trickle down from whatever was done at the canonical. So we do have, um, we know we need to validate against the canonical and be able to inherit certain changes. Um, exactly how that's going to work out, we haven't quite designed that yet, but it is a big part of our requirements is to be able to validate to that, um, against the canonical and be able to inherit those changes. So it, it, it may be one of those, like, it depends on which field is different, whether it automatically trickles down or not. I think it might even be the first from what you're thinking, Carol. Uh, but you change it as a, or you change it as the offering and you want it to backfill the canonical? Or back update the canonical? No, right. It is the canonical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always like. Oops, we got the credit wait wrong. Yeah. We want to fix yeah. it and not have to remove all the students and re-add them to get the credit wait. Right. Um, I think it's a recognized business need. I, I think that as everything, um, so I think part of our requirements, how it's going to play out in actual design is TBD. But it's on our radar, definitely. So, good question. Hey, Carol. Hey, Carol. Uh-huh. I think your mic is saying echo on people talk. It's making it hard to hear others. Okay, I'll mute. Thanks. Okay. Um, just a couple of slides left that I get to share with you. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about uh, or mentioned seat counts. Um, Kuali has uh, this concept of both seat counts and seat pools, um, and there is a difference, the difference being uh, primarily that a seat count is the, uh, the total number of seats that have been um, set up for a particular course offering or reg group um, to allow students to register into, whereas a seat pool is, is kind of a subset of that seat count, and, and it is um, set up so that you can, uh, in a more granular way, divvy up that seat count across different populations of students or students with different attributes um, to uh, uh, and manage uh, registration into those courses. So if you have a, a course that 
um, has uh, both juniors and seniors only uh, as an enrollment restriction. Um, you can set up uh, your seat pools so that 20% of them are for juniors and 80% of them are for seniors. Um, and, and kind of the effect of that is that as uh, if the, the junior uh, pool fills up, um, those students will be directed to a wait list, uh, even if the senior pool of rooms still has space available in it. And then kind of the last uh, concept that I'm going to cover here is registration queues. And essentially these are wait lists and hold lists. And I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail because I think Hugh is going to touch on these later, um, but only to, to mention the fact that um, uh, we understand that uh, both lists, if they were already created in a previous uh, version of a course that is being rolled over or copied, um, uh, that that rollover, rollover process is going to uh, roll over the uh, wait list rules and information as well. And then, of course, if you're creating a course uh, from the, uh, uh, in, in the ad hoc or from the catalog type process, uh, you'll have the ability to go in and um, set up whatever wait list or hold list criteria you would like to have for a particular course. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Good morning. Um, so from a service perspective, um, first of all, I want to say there's, there's really one class two service course offering, which uh, lines up with the business. There are a number of class one services underneath that, um, the, the main one being the learning unit instance, so it, it is the instance of the canonical. Um, in terms of concepts, I think that Bob and, and has done a great job of explaining and, and Christina's done a great job of, of demonstrating um, a lot of the service concepts that are really part of course offering. Reg group is a big one, um, seat count, seat pools, wait until, I'm sorry, wait list and then hold list. Um, so what I want to spend a few minutes on is, you know, we've got all this stuff, but we still need to interact with a scheduler. And I think, as you all know, scheduling is not on the radar for quality students for a while. So in this interim first piece, we will actually be interfacing back and forth between a scheduling engine, if you will. So the um, rather complicated diagram that you see up here, I'm going to try to um, make it uh, not, not too complicated. Um, if we start down on the bottom, um, there's really, there are really two sort of aspects to what's going on with a, a scheduling request. There's the, the, the time slot, you know, when is that thing going to be offered, and then the where. So from a um, working from the bottom, at the canonical level, you know, we're tracking um, contact hours per week. So there might be three contact hours per week. Um, there may be some pedagogy requirements around that, like I really want this as three one-hour meetings or I want this two one-and-a-half-hour one meetings. That would translate into some kind of time slot, time slot being the day of the week and time pattern. So it's really those two aspects. So it might be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 2, or Tuesday, Thursday, 1 to 2.30. Again, what is in this whole bottom box is what we're going to refer to as a scheduling request. Because over on the, on the enrollment side, we're really dealing initially with what's the request. The scheduler then, is the engine, is going to have to actually do all the work to confirm that, move things around you know, as needed, and then, and then send that information back once it's scheduled. So then if we go over to the right-hand side of that bottom box, we're really saying there's a format, it's a lecture or a lab, um, what kind of location requirements might there be? As part of specifying that, you might be very generic and talk about the type of space you need. Um, you might also have specific things in mind. Again, we're, we're allowing for that idea of location being very general, not at all, or very specific. So these sort of come together. Again, we're going kind of from the bottom up into what, it's not a great name, so don't hold me on the name, but this 
idea of a scheduling um, component template. It really is now that footprint of the of the request for the room, the space, and the and the um, time that you want to have this particular course scheduled. Over on you see that little box that says extra and or deleted meetings. Um, we also know, and this is this is a, a bit of a bottleneck or, or, or a challenge in some of our systems, that there may also be some one-offs. There may be a certain day in that pattern that, um, and this is now specific dates and times within that time frame that are either going to be additional meetings like there's a required safety training that's going to be held in the auditorium in advance of the lab starting for whatever this thing is. Or you may be removing some single meetings. So the idea that is then that we're also going to track those things and those are what's really going to feed into the scheduler. Over on the left is really our academic calendar because there's a whole bunch of other things that we're going to be keeping track of that have to do with um, actual instruction days um, and then of course what term are we talking about which will provide this framework. So those then can feed into the scheduler. The scheduler can then do its thing. Um, we're also showing up in that little red box that we also need some presentation or representation of this actual scheduled information that we can then feed to um, support some of the interfaces that you'll see um, that we saw a little bit in the sort of calendar view of, of the rollover, but also you'll see in a little bit when we get to more of the student view. So iCattle is a, is a pretty standard calendaring format, and that will let us then um, represent that data as specific events like calendar for the student. Questions? Great, let's go to the next slide. So this feeds in a little bit to some of the, um, I, I know we, you know, sort of mentioned briefly, but, but there are some other courses that also have some implications for our scheduling. So joint courses being two separate offerings that have their own activities, but they need to come together from a, a, a sharing perspective from the space. So these are some of the, the, the um, anomalies or, or extra things that we'll also have to feed into the scheduler. So this is where we're going to have to tell the scheduler or provide the override that it's okay that these two things happen in the same place. Um, similarly, you know, cross-listed are, are also sharing space from a scheduling perspective, but they've got different registration groups, different seat pools, um, different enrollment restrictions um, as needed. Um, there's, a, there's a third thing that sort of feeds in. It's really just a scheduling concept, which is room share. You may have a number of, um, you know, art studio things that can all be different classes happening in the same large physical space. Room share, then, is really just a scheduling concept. The fact that, you know, these two classes or four classes or eight classes are all in the same space is not something that needs to be known except for from a scheduling perspective. So these are some of the... Um, subtleties that we started to tease out in terms of how we really get the interaction correct between what's over on the student side and what's over on the scheduling side. That's it. Questions? Alternating week patterns, things like that? Absolutely. I think, you know, we're, it's, I, I think that whatever the um, ways we need to define, again, we always use something simple, you know, for a, a presentation like this, but absolutely. There, there are a couple things that are happening, too. If you, if you remember from the academic calendar discussion, we've also got this concept of mini-mesters within, you know, regular semesters. So the combination of the the term, and then this ability to set these patterns, um, I, I think will hopefully, you know, alleviate us from some of the constraints that we have today. Thanks. All right, we have okay. 38 minutes. <laughs>